today to talk about deployment for Office 365. So I think we're going to get into it now. Uh, I wanted to get a raise of hands. How many Office 365 customers do we have today? Perfect. Quite a few. And as far as customers who have feel like they have fully deployed Office 365. Good. So we uh, hopefully will help the rest of you today in talking about the, the Office 365 deployment efforts. Um, and, and as we go into that, uh, we'll go from kind of high level pilots down into the, the deployment side of how we envision the methodology and how our customers can, can get through the process, all the way to some of the more technical details around ADFS, hybrid configurations. Uh, and so hopefully we'll flow along that path as we go with, with each of the speakers uh, coming up. So I just wanted to really quickly introduce Office 365 to those of you who, who did not raise your hand. Uh, and really around the importance of the, the pillars of investments from Microsoft that we're making around the new Office and Office 365. Uh, it is devices, cloud, social, and control. And you've probably seen some of these slides if you've worked with your partner or account team. So I'm not going to go into too detail, but, but it is, and hopefully you've seen a ton this week, uh, about devices, and it's about having those rich experiences across the devices. The immersive experiences, whether you're use, utilizing the desktop or utilizing some of our new modern apps. And then obviously from the cloud, which we are going to talk about a ton today, but it's not just uh, the servers and, and back inside of Exchange and SharePoint and Link, but it's also Office as a service. And Yoni's going to talk a little bit about the deployment of Office as a service and how that changes the game uh, from, from the Microsoft standpoint and from how you can actually deploy and control the subscription-based service. And then from a social perspective, news feeds, microblogging, extending with Yammer, having those capabilities all across Office, uh, and we're going to talk about that in some of our pilot and deployment scenarios and how you can extend your pilot or extend your deployment into other pieces of the service, not just Exchange, not just one point, but actually trying to utilize all the services together, whereas we really see that's the value from an Office 365 perspective. And then from a control, and, and this is really the kind of step three as we talk about it in our deployment, but layering in some of the advanced services, layering in some of the protection, the, the uh, online archiving, and some of those advanced scenarios that you can step through as you complete out an Office 365 deployment. So there's the, the all up message, and, and from a, a perspective of uh, bringing productivity through, just wanted to highlight the, the side that is not only uh, are these enterprise grade services, we expect enterprise type of deployments. We know that businesses are very complex. We have a rich history and, and legacy of on-premises uh, information and architecture. And we want to make sure that from a, an office and from Microsoft's perspective, we're bringing that rich history, the legacy side, the on-premises software and architecture and helping you move that to the cloud and also be able to intercommunicate with that as you go through deployment. So let's speak about deployment. Uh, and, and we really have tried to break this down into three steps, from pilot to deploy to enhance. And what you'll see from the Microsoft side is, is a very concerted effort to try to highlight some of the capabilities that we can go through in a pilot without truly manipulating your current infrastructure and then moving to a deployment scenario within the services as far as Exchange and Link and SharePoint that allows you to have, without having to go really deep in the coexistence side, allows you to have mailboxes online, allows you to have mail flow and routing, and be able to have your, your users synchronized with the cloud. So we're going to talk about step one, step two, and then step three. And step three is really where it, towards the end of the presentation. We'll get into ADFS, the configuration for hybrid, and some of the more uh, technical side of connecting on-premises to online. But from the Microsoft perspective, we have been doing these online deployments with our customers and partners for about the last six years with Office 365, previously BPAWS, before that MMS, where it was a, a more dedicated environment. But we have been working with our customers on 
what cloud deployment actually means. What is it that you have to do? Uh, you know, we went from, I don't know if you've, you've ever read it, but the Mod G, which was the Microsoft Online Deployment Guide, which is about 110 pages. Uh, so we've kind of gone from that side, and we're trying to simplify the process, not only with documentation and guidance, but also with tools that our engineering team is releasing to help in your deployment. Uh, who here had to do some AD remediation to move to the cloud? A few hands up there. So we see that, and we see that our customers are coming along in a point of their AD, and we put out products like ID Fix to help with the deployment. So there's a, it, this isn't just kind of a marketing side of Microsoft trying to say, hey, it's really easy to go to the cloud, here's your three steps but we also are integrated in with the engineering team so that as we come across what might be typical deployment blockers with AD remediation, with, with password synchronization, that we actually are adding from an investment perspective to those tools to help you move to the cloud easier. So you'll see some of those as we talk about the deployment side. And for a kind of in-depth look at these three steps, You'll see here from Pilot, it's utilizing the onmicrosoft.com domain. It's getting value from the service perspective, and that really is core to the scenario. We want to make sure our customers are not waiting for huge pieces of implementation work to be able to actually experience the service. New, the new office has a ton to bring from a business perspective, whether it's SkyDrive Pro, sharing documents, getting some of that external access or it's just having your mail flow through to all your devices. You know, we have had huge announcements with releases across all kinds of platforms as far as Office and Office 365. We want you to be able to experience that as you're doing your deployment so that we're not waiting for the, the first mailbox to be on board uh, weeks or even months later, but that we are actually utilizing the service as a service, not looking at it as a traditional uh, deployment, but helping you start to gain value very early. So step one, you'll see that. Walking through scenarios to help you actually use service, use office, deploy, self-deploy. And then you work into the step two, which is a deployment. It is when you are starting down the path to actually move production mailboxes into the cloud, move production data into your sites, and move users in groups so that they can have a great cloud experience while the whole organization starts to move through. And you see there that adds features like password synchronization through Dersync. It adds uh, the ability to ID fix and work with your Active Directory. Uh, it adds some of the core pieces of IT-led or partner-led migration paths. Uh, and it starts to utilize that shared namespace your own verified domain, and really working through a, a, a simple coexistence scenario. And what we feel like from a step three perspective in working with our customers and partners is that all of the deeper tasks can actually move towards step three. So once you have the simple coexistence, you're utilizing the service from a mail routing and namespace, if you feel like from an organizational perspective that you have ADFS as a necessary uh, environment, then we can move to that. If you've invested in 2010 or 2013 architecture from an exchange perspective, and you want to enable some of those hybrid scenarios, you can then do that from a step three perspective. So it's trying to be just very more uh, you know, thoughtful and guided through our deployment methodology to help our customers get from that early pilot all the way through to a deployment with the help of partners and, and with your Microsoft account team. And so when I look at the pilot experience and what you can experience, and you'll see a, a pretty good eye chart here, but we're at tech ed, so I think eye charts are necessary. Um, the experience from a pilot is work with your account team, work with your partner, and get started on the service. And it, for the half of the hands that have not, uh, are not Office 365 customers, this is where you begin. And you have uh, you know, the ability to rapidly uh, start utilizing the service, immediately be able to use SkyDrive Pro and SharePoint and Link, and also your Outlook web access with a connected account so that you have a rich inbox the very first time you log in. And you move through some of the scenarios that we are trying to help our customers through to say, uh, pilot the collaboration tools, uh, office across multiple devices, and I spoke to this, uh, being able to go to your app store, go to the, the Android marketplace, and actually utilize Office 365 across devices. 
check it on your surface and see some of those OneNote apps and some of the integration points we have with those modern applications so that you actually have a feel for how this is going to be within your environment. And none of this is throwaway. So the steps, the activities, and, and how we are guiding our customers through moves into production. So you can always start very small and easy and then move that tenant into production as you go. And so from a pilot experience, I wanted to, to highlight some of our scenarios. So I'm going to move to my, my demonstration and show you. What you see here is the, the Fast Track website, and it has, it has two T's, not, not one T, but it is your Fast Track way <coughs> to Office 365, and it's fasttrack.office.com. And this is where we're outlining our deployment methodology for our customers, for our partners, to be very clear in, in how we feel like you should be moving to Office 365. And so what you see here is uh, quick and easy steps linked to all of our back-end TechNet technical articles to help you actually move through the scenario. So whether you're doing a pilot or whether you're moving through a deployment phase, you can see all these steps actually work through converting your, paid, uh, your trial to paid, setting up your domain, transitioning your pilot users. Now, obviously, this is where some of the, the bigger questions come into play when you're looking to deploy. And so we've added in those tools to be able to utilize, like ID Fix for remediation, password sync for getting your first users synchronized with the cloud with their passwords. So it's not a true ADFS single sign-on, but it is a single sign-on with their corporate credentials. But moving through these steps is, is pretty quick and easy, and you can actually start the service very quick with your, with your account team or partner. And this is our very public, straightforward, this is what we want you to do. All of our partners, all of our field sales, our technical field sales, this is what they will be talking to our customers about. And so we want to have a place where you can go to understand so that the conversation is two ways, that you see what we're trying to position, you're feeling it from your field teams and partners, and that you see it as a reality within your organization. And so what I wanted to show next was uh, something that we're doing from our field and partner perspective with cloud deployment partners in the Microsoft field is they can actually start your pilot for you. And when they start your pilot for you, the first experience is really your SharePoint uh, team site. And the team site takes all of that great fast track information that's publicly available and then drills down into it so that you can have more information as you go through your pilot. So with a, a cloud deployment partner or with your account team, you can start your service and start moving forward. And SharePoint Online becomes the hub of your interactivity. So being able to go through your, your plan, whether you're an IT pro or an end user pilot member, trying to help you understand the steps that are necessary. And when I look at this SharePoint list, yep, it's a huge list. It's SharePoint. You can synchronize it with, with uh, Project. You can synchronize it with Outlook. But in each one of these steps, you'll see it goes just the same way as our FastTrack.Office.com, but with some deeper information. So when I want to connect my existing email accounts, I can simply click into that task, go into it very quickly, and see all the steps necessary as I move through the task. So from an IT perspective, I not only see the tasks that, that should help me get through this pilot, but I then actually can help my end users to go through it. And as I do, each step builds upon itself, and I can keep moving through the scenario. The other piece is looking at pilot members. So you know, when we think of office.com and, and all of the content on office.com, we've taken some of that information that we feel is very valuable, positioned it into the SharePoint site, which is part of a, a, a Office 365 pilot, and allowed the, you to send your users to here to be able to learn what's new with Office 2013, what's new with Office 365. So not only do you have IT pro tasks, but you also have end user tasks. And you can help your end users get training and move through the scenarios and being able to look at your video learning where you can see uh, over 100 videos that actually show your end users how to work with Outlook, how to work with Link, uh, and all the different pieces that you may uh, want to help deploy out to them. So it's an IT pro portal and it's an end user portal to help you move through your pilot following through those steps. The last piece I'm going to show during, during this is uh, also, you know, we don't want to provision demo content into our customers, but we want to help you understand what's possible 
maybe from an HR and accounting perspective, maybe from an IT case management side, or your sales and marketing team. So what we've done is we've added templates into these pilots to allow you to see, hey, this is what Visio services actually looks like inside of SharePoint. Do you have a deployment or a pipeline or a or report that you want to have real-time data to? Go ahead and put that into the sales pipeline. Or a power view that you want to be able to collect data and see some of those rich features from an office perspective. We've given you the samples so that you can start integrating that into your workflow when you're going through a pilot. And all of this is trying to be really helpful from a perspective of having some tips putting information here. You know, maybe you are very advanced, you don't need tips, you kind of know what you want to do with SharePoint, but these are ideas that we are trying to help our end users and organizations move through pilot into their deployment and then beyond. So you can talk to your account team or your partner, your cloud deployment partner, and they can start you on this path so that all these resources are available to you through a standard uh, trial pilot tenant. Uh, so we'll go back to the, uh, the presentation and talk a little bit more about deployment. And Ben's gonna get into the deploy side. So step one, do a pilot, see the information, see the details, get into it and really try to think about how you wanna use Office 365. And then once you're utilizing that pilot, able to kind of see the, the information that's readily available, help your business make decisions from an IT pro standpoint, then we start moving into pilot, and that's where it, or into deployment, where it gets a little more of the technical side and into some of those steps. So I'm going to give it here to Ben Thank you. and have him go through deployment. Thank you. So when we start to think about 365 and we think about a cloud service, um, you know, and one of the things that I love about 365 is that it gets rid of the idea of waves of technology. Um, when you start to think about, you know, historically Microsoft went into these kind of three-year development cycles. And at the end of three years, we'd give you a new version of Exchange, a new version of Link, a new version of SharePoint, a new version of Office. And then you go, well, this year we're going to do Exchange, next year we're going to do Link, next year we're going to do SharePoint, and then we're going to do Office. And no one's ever on the same set of technology, so you never get all the benefits of the stuff that's there. And this is one of the things when we start to look at 365 that really helps with that. So while we've gone through and we've gone through this pilot experience, we've set up all of the web-based technologies, we've got Outlook Web Access up and running, we're now looking at some of the client-side integration pieces. And what I want to do is I want to hand over to Yoni briefly just to talk about some of the things around specifically the Office piece, deploying the Office client from Office 365, and what are some of the differences there, first of all, and then we'll start to move into some of the other pieces around the setup process that you can look at as well. Okay. Thanks, Ben. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I, I think, Ben, you make a really interesting point in that the, the, the way that the Office division delivers those product updates has totally changed now. So, like Ben said, we used to be in a scenario where every three years a new version of Exchange, SharePoint, Link, OCS and the Office client would come out and there would quite often be a mismatch of versions between those different products. And in some cases that wasn't too much of an issue. So, for example, if an organisation was running SharePoint 2010 uh, but was still on Exchange 2007, that might be a workable solution. However, if they wanted to leverage a lot of the value of that SharePoint 2010 environment, they would definitely want to have the Office 2010 clients installed across their fleet. And that has certainly created some challenges in the past around how do we make sure that we leverage the value of the, of the server-side uh, workloads through the Office client. So with the evolution of BPOS and Office 365, those server-side uh, workloads have certainly shifted very, very seamlessly and very efficiently into the cloud and are now in a position where you as the, the, the end users, as the, the implementers of this technology can get on board with them in a very quick and rapid fashion. But it certainly left a challenge around the Office client because the Office client has always been, and in a lot of cases may always be, a rich desktop or end device uh, workload. And so because of that, uh, how do we deal with the, 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 the challenge of keeping the broader audience aligned with the same version of the client bits that they have in the server workloads? Uh, there's some really exciting announcements that have gone on recently. Uh, we now have Office clients that are available on three mobile platforms. That solved part of that problem because those workloads are, and the, the, those bits are quite easy to update. Um, you know, new functionality becomes available in the server-side workloads that needs to be lined up with the, the end client workloads. 
We can put a new build of the mobile clients across those three stores, and people will automatically download those updates, and it's a fairly seamless process. So the vision was to have something that would allow that same level of efficiency with the full Office client on a desktop. And so that's where the new Office as a Service functionality comes in. You probably hear it uh, referred to as click to run quite often. Um, and this is the new deployment capability for Office. It's, it, it is based on the App V virtualization technology, although there is no uh, requirement or prerequisite that those clients be installed or that you have licenses for App V or anything like that. It's just based on that technology. And it's, and it's really exciting for us because what it allows us to do is to push a consistent level of Office either from the Office content delivery network or the cloud, the Office 365 service, down onto machines, or for that content to be locally staged from within inside your corporate network and however that infrastructure might look, whether it's a simple file share or utilizing a multi-site system center config manager environment. It, it, it doesn't really matter in either way. But really, the way that we, should, we need to be thinking about this now is how, how can we be more efficient about the, the Office client that we're, that we're uh, pushing out to our end users? And this uh, click to run capability is certainly something that enables that. Um, we are going to do a, a, quite a, a big deep dive into that this afternoon at 3.30 OSP 315, just next door. Um, and in that session, we'll cover off the, the considerations around identity, around infrastructure, and uh, how to actually deploy those bits around doing subsequent updates. And uh, if that's something that's of interest, then uh, please come along to that session. Thank you, Yoni. So if we think about that now, we've got our, our clients deployed, we've got our mail coming through, we've got a service that's up and running, we've got users who are, and I, I hate the term, but it's one I'll use anyway, is we're using it in anger. Day to day, they're in, they're now going and using Office 365 because that's what they do. We want to start to take this a step further, and we're going to start to look at, at what we can do for the next steps of deploy. Um, so I'm going to, and I know you can't see what I'm doing, I promise you will soon. Uh, seven. Um, I'm going to switch back over here as well. So how many people, wow, that's really small, let's do that. How many people here have seen this, uh, this window before? Yeah? Isn't it nice? It's nice and white and clean. So the next steps we had around deploy were really around you know, things like um, putting in our, our directory synchronization, running ID fix, but also doing things like registering our domain namespace within the service. And the key thing here is around then starting to make this service yours. When you first sign up, we give you a dot on Microsoft uh, namespace. It's a chicken and egg scenario. We need to give you a domain before you can get services provision, but you can't give us your domain until we provision your services. So we give you a placeholder in the first, in the first instance. So when you come in, what you're going to do is actually go in and register your own domains in here. Now, I'm going to call this out for those of you who haven't done that. This is not a replacement for your domain hosting provider today. All we're doing is allowing you to use this domain. Okay? So when you come in and register a domain, you'll go in and say, I want to add my own domain in here, and I'm going to put in you know, foobar.com, contoso.com, whatever that happens to be. You notice we have very clear, easy to follow steps as part of this as well. And simply all we're doing is, is verifying ownership of the domain. You can't go in and register Microsoft.com and set up your own Office 365 service like that because you can't verify you own it. Now, the way we go about that verification process is we get you to add a TXT record to your DNS. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward very non-intrusive, um, very easy to set up and go through. Once we have that done, our next step is then to start and think about things like how do we go through the, the synchronization process of our, of our users into the Office 365 servers. And there's, there's two steps to that. The first is using the tool that, uh, that Jeff mentioned, which is ID fix, and that's around remediating my, uh, my service, and then going through and setting up my um, directory synchronization. But before I do anything on my server side, I need to activate the servers. And so it's a matter of coming into my 365 service, turning on Active Directory synchronization. And you, as again, you can see, we have all the steps needed to go through what you need to do. So prepare your service, get everything up and running. I can also go ahead and say, you know, I'm just going to activate my dire Active Directory synchronization, go ahead and do that. And, uh, and that way, the service is up and ready to be, uh, for me to go and synchronize accounts through. Now, once that's done, I come back to my, uh, back to my environment internally. And here I have my, uh, my Dersync server. So uh, Dersync as a tool is actually built off uh, Forefront Identity Manager. Um, and this is the, a separate server. You can't deploy Dersync onto your DC, so it's, a, it's just another piece of uh, another VM you have running in the environment. 
And the first thing I'm going to do now that I'm in this environment and I'm back on prem is I'm actually going to go and run a, a remediation process across my uh, across my service. And the first thing I'm going to run here is is ID fix. Now ID fix is actually going to search through my Active Directory and look for accounts that violate the uh, the requirements for Office 365. And what you can see here is I've got uh, eight records that have come back that I have issues with. Now these are things like incorrect characters, names that are too long, names that are wrong, names that are blank, bad UPNs, et cetera, et cetera. This is a much quicker way for me to be able to go through and remediate the base things of my um, Active Directory service and still get through that deployment phase and start to get to that, that higher level of integration. Now as I come through here, I get listed out all the accounts, what the error is, so I can see that Alan here has some, uh, some bad characters in his name. I can see what the value is today and what ID fix is going to do to update and fix that value. So it's very simple for me to be able to come through and, and get a good look at what this tool is about to do for me. I then choose what action I want to do as part of that. So I can either turn around and say, you know what, I'm going to make that edit, I'm going to remove that um, account from the sink, or I'm going to uh, mark it as complete and say that it's fixed. Once I go through and do that, I hit accept, and it'll go through and apply those changes for me. Now, as I go through and do that, IDFix is also keeping a log of all the changes that are made to those accounts. Because you're not going to randomly go through and change accounts in AD and not have a log of it. Because if, if it turns out that that account I updated is, uh, you know, uh, you know, Jeff Medford at Microsoft.com and it turns out Jeff's actually the, also the service account that's running one of the key services internally, it's going to cause us some problems. So I've got a log of information there so I can actually go and, and roll back those changes if I need to and find another way to re um, remediate those moving forward. Once my ID fix is done and my, my AD is in a place for synchronization, I can then go and run my directory synchronization tool. Now, this has come a long way since we first released Dersync. Initially, Dersync was a 32-bit tool, um, lots of PowerShell access to actually go and force sync and those kind of things. And that's still there, but we, you know, we've got a nicer GUI on it as well. Now, one of the things you're going to probably see here is that we call this out as Active Directory uh, synchronize, uh, Azure Active Directory synchronization. Truth is, behind Office 365 is a Windows Azure Active Directory. We figure, let's let the Active Directory service team run the Active Directory service. It makes sense, right? So when you're synchronizing your accounts up, they're actually going to a Windows Azure Active Directory. And that's what this tool will set up the synchronization with. Now, it is a simple point and click tool. I go through, I specify username and password for my, uh, my existing domain. And this will probably be a service account that you'll set up, has read access to your accounts within your Active Directory. It has the ability then to pull those accounts out and push them up to 365. Um, I then put in the admin credentials for my 365 service as well, which will allow me to then go through and, and have an account there that will actually go and create those accounts for me. Now, one of the newest things around this service is that we'll also do a password synchronization from your Active Directory server on-premise to Office 365. Now, before you sit there and look at me and go, I'm not letting you send my clear text passwords up the wire, that's not what we're doing. So in Active Directory, every password is hashed. It's all encrypted. And what we do is we take that hash, we rehash it again, and then we send it up to Office 365. So we never send a clear password up to the service. What we send is a hashed encrypted password, a double hashed encrypted password, up to Office 365. On the flip end of 365, we know the algorithms for Active Directory to, to take a password from the 365 hash back and to hash the password that comes through from the user. So when the user goes and puts in pass at word one as their password, we will hash that using the Active Directory protocol and hash it with the 365 protocol, and those two values should match. And the beauty here is, is that I no longer have to have, at this level, all of the infrastructure around Active Directory Federation services to be able to get that experience for users where they have the same password between the two. And this will continue to resync those passwords up to the service for me as well. So that we also remove that possibility of having passwords out of sync and that person calling the help desk every five minutes because they've forgotten whether it was a lowercase p or an uppercase p on their password. So now we're at this point where we have a very synchronized and, uh, and in-sync environment for our deployment perspective. The other piece we're going to start to look at is, is how we pull in some of the mobile connectivity pieces. I've seen this done in a couple of ways, but we really want to start to get um, users taking advantage of these nice smartphone devices that they have sitting with them, right? There's no point in having a mobile workforce if the workforce can't access anything on their mobile. So we're going to go through and start to look at how we set that up. I've seen this done in a couple of ways within environments. Probably the best one I've seen when people have done a migration, a big migration, was that they actually had a room where people could go in and get their mobiles configured, which was an ideal way to do that. So they could actually go through and get that all set up and ready for them. And then we start to look at things like DLP tools um, and Exchange Online protection configuration. So we want to start to look at how are we setting up our anti-spam, antivirus rules? What are we doing around policies within the organization that maybe we are or are not working with today? So when we look at things like you know, people who are sending, responding to emails from that Nigerian prince, 
Um, by the way, I actually got a message yesterday morning, I think from the UK, I won $2.4 billion. So this will be my last session. I've just got to send through my bank details. It'll all be taken care of soon. Um, but those kind of phishing attempts, you can start to put in rules with DLP to prevent your staff from doing the wrong thing. So being able to notify them using the office client around things of, hey, we don't want you sending your credit card information out to people outside the organization. Or, you know what, we have policies around that type of data. We consider that personally identifiable information. Don't send that out. We consider that a, uh, an Australian health record. Don't send that out. So those kind of things, helping your users to do the right thing first. Now, you can take that from a warning up to a much more um, enforced policy as you move forward. So if the user looks at it and says, ah, screw it, I'm just going to send that anyway. That Nigerian prince is going to give me money. Um, then I can actually turn around and, and block that mail and take that further. So configuring that DLP is really key here. But IT's idea on that DLP is lock it down as hard as possible. You probably want to kind of have some levels there. And this is where you get the chance to play with that and get that to the right space. That one. All right. So, Jeff, do you want to take us through some of these onboarding paths? Yeah, I do. So, um, from the onboarding perspective, I'll just keep this in there. Um, you know, obviously, there, there are decisions to make as you're onboarding. And what we want to highlight in some of these slides is, is that this isn't just a, you know, as it's a three-step process, you also have decisions and a, a tree of ways to go to try to help your organization in the best possible way. So we're in a, in a pilot scenario here, coming from an exchange as the source. And obviously, in a pilot, you start with the cloud ID. Some of the things to talk about are of, of how you're going to do your pilot migration are, are you going to actually do some self-service? So do you want your users who are in this pilot to go out to the, the uh, portal.microsoftonline.com and actually download Click to Run from there? Do you want them to utilize their connected accounts so that their mailbox will actually connect back to your exchange, pull in the, through POP or IMAP their mail, and be able to utilize that through Outlook Web Access? And some of those decisions need to be made as you're moving along from a pilot scenario. And you can see that self-service, in, in some cases, is, is how we get a, a very broad base of adoption. But obviously, we need to think about some of the security, whether you're going to deploy, as Yoni said, from your own internal uh, servers and systems. But as you move through from the pilot to these, some of these decisions, we allow technologies like the PST, PST import tool, which we've also developed out to be able to allow you to capture PSTs within your environment and push them up to Office 365, or whether you're going to do an IMAP. And again, this is the pilot side. So we haven't even moved to deploy. And you have options around how users will experience email within a pilot without disrupting their on-premises uh, logins or mail flow or anything else. So as you move through the pilot with Cloud ID, whether you're going self-service or IT-driven, you can then look at connected accounts, IMA migrations. And as you come through from a cloud identity perspective to deploy, you then have a couple steps that you want to work through also. Shared namespace is critical from a deploy. You want, as, as we mentioned, you want to make sure that you're verifying your domain. Your, your users are then becoming your organization with the .com.au. And then you work through a deployment of self-service or IT-driven, which is, again, full uh, IMAP migrations, PST imports. Depending on the technology that you have in place, uh, you can even go one step further and put in some of the, the migration from a coexistence perspective. So if you're on 2003 or 2007 exchange, there's easy ways to pull information out from IMAP to PST during these first phases of deployment. If you're on 2010, you obviously have uh, the 2010 uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid wizard with SP3 that would allow you to connect, even if you don't have ADFS, connect your exchange to the cloud from 2010 or 2013. So you have some of these options as you move through. And I, and I wanted to just map out those decisions you'd be making. Because as you get to enhanced, and if you have the proper technology or want to implement some later versions from 2010 to 2013, you can then do hybrid migrations. So you can start small with IMAP, with connected accounts, with PST import. You can move through your deployment with the shared namespace. And then as it fits from a business perspective, you might want to put in uh, exchange hybrid configurations so that you can use MRS and use the technology to simply move mailboxes from premise to cloud, back and forth uh, as part of your infrastructure. 
So there are definite decision points as you move through pilot to deploy to enhance, and we wanted to highlight some of those uh, coming from that exchange environment. So we're uh, going to talk about some of those onboarding resources and tools. And the, these, uh, we already went in, th in through uh, detail from a demo perspective, so I just want to show some of the highlights from an ID fix perspective, and so that when you get this, uh, when you get this deck uh, from the, the resources, you have the TechNet links. But being able to fix and provide information, uh, as been showed, to help you remediate your AD before doing DirSync. And, and we've seen this as a big help, because we have some fairly stringent uh, criteria within the Windows Azure AD, and your, your AD might not have all of those stringent criteria. So we really wanted to help bring that out in the forefront and help you walk through. So it's across all the objects, be able to remediate, uh, and you see some of the examples of account name, target address, user principal name. So those are all just pieces to try to help you move through your AD uh, remediation. And you saw the demo of the tool um, already very quickly. Uh, and adding into that some of the Azure AD scoping, and I, I think we, we aren't quite going to talk about that, but I wanted to highlight. Um, you saw it's just kind of a click button, DirSync. And it's very powerful what it's doing, but it is just a couple of options. Put your creds in, and all of a sudden, your directory is synchronizing with the cloud. You do have options to be able to scope per OU within your AD, to scope to the users who you want to have move to the cloud. We've seen this in a lot of cases where maybe a piece of the business is going to the cloud or a piece of the business is going to work differently. And so you can scope now from an AD perspective. Um, and that is just a little, little more in depth, but being able to let, allow our customers to do that has been a real big positive for them. So I am going to uh, hand it off now from an enhance. So we've gone from piloting some of the kind of user-specific things you can do, connected accounts, SharePoint. We moved into some of the deploy scenarios where you're verifying your name, you're doing dir sync, password sync, and maybe even uh, some coexistence in a simple perspective. And then now we move to enhance. And this really is as your deployment has gone along. Some of the things to think about from ADFS and, and profiles and leveraging some of the advanced technologies. So I'm going to hand it over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, what I'll be focusing on during this enhanced section of the presentation is actually identity. Because for me, when I came into the Office 365 environment, identity was one of the most confusing yet uh, important and integral parts of the actual environment. So as Ben mentioned earlier, when we're talking about identity with Office 365, we're really referring to Azure Active Directory. Now, there may be a little bit of confusion around that term because I've heard people refer to Azure Active Directory as Azure Access Control Services. That's not the same thing. That's part of Azure Active Directory. Um, I've also heard them refer to as um, <clears throat> running Active Directory on an Azure VM. Again, that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about Azure Active Directory. We're talking about a <clears throat> underlying identity platform for various cloud services that use accounts linked to a single organization. Uh, in Office 365 case, Windows is your Active Directory. Now, that has actually always been the case. It's only now that the visibility of Azure is really coming up, and we're seeing things such as Active Directory coming up through the Azure portal. So uh, when we're also talking about identity, we have more than one, just, uh, one single story with identity. So I'm going to take you through a few of those. And the first one really is simple cloud-based identity. And that's where uh, you're in the Office 365 portal. You can see users at companyname.onmicrosoft.com. Now, these exist in the cloud. They don't exist anywhere else. These are uh, like an Outlook.com account. This is ideal for small, agile organizations that don't require or do not have an on-premise directory. Other options might be more appropriate for larger orgs who have you know, more complicated requirements. So with that, we've got directory synchronization and password synchronization, which is what we were referring to earlier. Uh, there is a small on-premises requirement for these, and that DirSync needs to be installed somewhere. And uh, we'll get to this a bit later, but one of the kind of step backwards for me going to Office 365 was having to install more servers into my data center. Did anyone else find that? Just me. Great. Um, the last thing I wanted to do when moving to the cloud was install more servers on premises. Uh, fortunately, we've got some ways around that, and we'll discuss those in a second. 
<clears throat> um, password sync will, if you will, be going down the directory synchronization and password synchronization option. Password sync will only keep passwords in sync. Um, if you do not have this, you may have to manage multiple passwords for your users, which may make a, a bit of a road bump to user experience. Um, there is no real requirement for DirSync for high availability because it's so easy to set up. If something went wrong, it's easier to just rebuild it in 20 minutes than it is to set up a high availability solution. There are no firewall requirements uh, on-premises for DirSync. You're really just pushing everything out to the cloud. And it's pretty much completely pre-configured. You can't do much with it except for a little bit of scoping and filtering, which we'll discuss in a sec. Technical difficulties, excuse me. Thank there you. we go. Let the office guy take care of that stuff. <laughs> it only took three of us to fix it. Uh, and the last option really is federated identity, which is uh, you're going to have a single federated identity between your on-premises directory and your Office 365 identity source. Uh, this is going to be the best option in terms of user experience, right? You really are signing, uh, signing on directly against a, um, your own Active Directory. Okay, the first one I want to talk to is our basic cloud identity. So for Bob to sign into Office 365, we're first going to need to populate our Office 365 or our Azure Active Directory with some users. Now, we can do this a multitude of different ways, but uh, for an example of one, I could mention OSP317, which is uh, in meeting room 9 at 6.30 this evening, which is using Windows PowerShell Magic to manage Office 365. Now, in that session, we're actually going to show you how to push identities into Azure AD and use them for Office 365. So if you're looking at simple population of identity, that would be an easy one to go to. So we're going to use a spreadsheet and PowerShell to push a whole heap of identities straight into Azure Active Directory. This will allow Bob to authenticate against Azure Active Directory and get access to all the services within Office 365. The next one up is directory and password sync. So for Bob to sign into Office 365 with a DirSync synchronization, we already have Bob's account in an on-premises directory. Um, what we're going to need to do is install DirSync onto that environment, which will then push the user accounts into Azure Active Directory. And this will, in turn, allow Office 365 to use user accounts that uh, are using exactly the same credentials as your on-premises Active Directory to sign into Office 365. So it, it is a form of single sign-on. It's very effective. Um, now, for anyone, uh, a brief side note here, for anyone who's curious about the password synchronization option, uh, has anyone heard of something called PCNS? Yeah, a couple of raises hands. So uh, back in the day for FIM, there was a, uh, a component called PCNS, so Password Change Notification Service. Now, this would allow you to do something similar. You know, every time a password was changed, you could go and force that password to be replicated somewhere else. The downside of that is it required a component to be installed on every single domain controller uh, in your domain. Now, if you're a security guy, you're probably not going to be a big fan of that. I could be wrong, but um, I've gone into organizations before, and that's just a no-no right off the bat. Fortunately, Password Sync now removes that option. Right? And I think, I, I could be wrong, but it's the only synchronization option that does that. Is that right? Yeah. There's no others. So it's, it's a really good step forward. The security guys love it, love hearing about it. Um, and as Ben mentioned earlier, <clears throat> when, um, when DirSync and Password Sync are used, no passwords are actually ever pushed up into the cloud. Only a hash is pushed up to the cloud. Um, now, this actually syncs more frequently than the other attributes in Active Directory that are synced up with DirSync. And the reason for that is, you know, if your password changes, you want it to be synchronized as quickly as possible. So the actual trigger for that is the password change. Uh, there is one little caveat I'd like to mention, too, and that's regarding password complexity. So <clears throat> if you've got password complexity set up on your Active Directory domain, um, those settings are going to take precedence and overwrite the settings that are synced up to uh, or set up in your Azure Active Directory. So your on-premises directory really becomes the master source for that kind of complexity. OK, uh, I am going to touch on scoping and filtering, filtering for synchronization using DirSync. Now, this is a fairly new feature, but customers can now exclude. Uh, so the filter is an exclusion filter, uh, objects from synchronization to Azure Active Directory. And this uh, can be scoped in multiple ways. So the first one is we can filter based on our domain. We can filter based on membership in an OU. So if a user is in a specific OU, exclude them from 
being synchronized. Uh, a great example, there might be service accounts. I like to keep my service accounts in a service accounts OU, so I can immediately exclude all of those uh, from synchronization. And another one is user attributes. So if I've got an attribute set on any account in Active Directory, I can use that to exclude. So I could, for instance, tag all of my service accounts with a specific attribute, or I could say, um, Everyone who lives in Sydney, I don't want to synchronize their accounts up to the cloud. There's a lot of flexibility there. You can use pretty much any attribute. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing to notice is when we're filtering these accounts, uh, it simply means that the account is ignored. It's not processed by the synchronization engine. Now, we have three options up on the board here. To the left, we have DirSync. In the middle, we've got the Office 365 connector. And to the right, we've got PowerShell and Graph API. Uh, the left-hand approach, DirSync, is really a cookie-cutter approach that will do most of what you need to do or you will be doing right at the start of your deployments. Um, it does provide the best experience to most customers using AD, but it may not be suitable uh, for some situations. Now, in the middle, we've got Office 365 Connector, and what that's actually referring to is an add-on that's available uh, for FIM. Now, uh, you guys might be able to confirm, this is about to change name, and it's currently in beta on TechNet, I think. It's the Azure AD connector? Yeah. We, yeah? Yeah. Sure. I don't, I don't know what name it'll go to, but okay. yes. It's, <laughs> it's going to change name shortly, and I believe it's in beta on TechNet, right, or it's in release candidate on TechNet right now. Um, what this does is it snaps into FIM and allows you to synchronize your directory, or multiple directories, really, to Office 365, because FIM gives you a whole heap of complexity around managing uh, multiple forests and multiple domains. And that's, that's one of the reasons why you might want to go there. Another reason might be that you, um, for those of you who know FIM, it's a really complicated product, and there's a lot of things you can do that are really cool. Uh, you can do pretty much filtering on anything that you could possibly want to do. You can set up advanced workflows. Um, but we're not going to really cover into that now. In fact, I'm going to mention another session, which is ATC334, the Identity Jigsaw Puzzle, which is going to be uh, in Central C on Friday at 1.45. Carol, who is an identity, uh, Forefront Identity Manager MVP, will be discussing some of the options there, so I highly recommend going to that session if you're thinking about using FIM to connect to Office 365. And finally to the right, we have um, the PowerShell and Graph API column, which is suitable for small to medium-sized organizations with or without AD. Uh, <clears throat> now, something to mention, Graph is um, only for MS Online. The reason why you might consider Graph or PowerShell is uh, for, you know, customization to a degree of your, your provisioning. Um, but if you're going to PowerShell, the big advantage over Graph is that you can script deployment of other services and licenses for users, whereas you can't actually do that with Graph. So you could, say, work with Link Online, Exchange Online, or SharePoint Online within PowerShell. So if you're going to go down the path for a small organization, that's probably what I'd recommend. Moving on. Uh, this is the third option, which is federated identity using a single sign-on. So for Bob to sign into Office 365, we've already got Active Directory on-premise. Um, we've already got DirSync set up and synchronizing accounts. Uh, this is actually one of the things people tend to stumble over a bit. When we're talking about single sign-on and ADFS, you actually need DirSync. Right? That is a requirement. You don't need, just need ADFS on its own. You need ADFS and DirSync. So we've got DirSync running already, synchronizing our accounts. Um, we're also going to need to establish a trust. And that trust is going to be between Active, uh, Azure Active Directory and an ADFS endpoint, such as an ADFS 2.0 proxy server. Now, Azure Active Directory will then trust any accounts that are being issued a token from this trust. Um, we don't really need to go into too much detail. There's a bunch of fantastic technical articles on this uh, I can always point you to. Now, uh, as Dersing's already provisioned the user accounts into Azure Active Directory, these user accounts and just the user accounts um, no passwords are being used for the provisioning and login. However, when you actually log into Azure AD, what it's going to do is ship you back to your ADFS endpoint and allow you to authenticate there, and then you can authenticate against the services and against the Azure AD with a token you've been issued by your own ADFS server. Uh, what's really important to note there is, even though we've set up DirSync, um, we haven't set up password sync. There are no passwords being replicated or no hashes of passwords being replicated into the cloud. So if you were worried about the uh, replication of passwords, right, that might be a stumbling block to adoption. If you're going down this path, you really don't need to worry about it. And this option here really is going to provide the best experience that you can possibly have for your end users. Some of the federation options. Uh, this is really going to be recommended for uh, any customers that are on Azure AD that have a large number of users. 
gives us single sign-on, gives us a nice secure token-based authentication with support for rich clients, completely Microsoft supported. Um, we can also start to use ActiveAuth, which is Microsoft Azure AD's two-factor authentication option. And uh, this will also work for all of the hybrid situations. But it will require some on-premise services, some licenses, and support. support. <clears throat> OK, what I'm going to do quickly is take you through a few authentication options. Uh, and the first one is, the if we're going to have federation set up, this is what it's going to look like when we're authenticating against uh, any websites or to Exchange Online or SharePoint Online. So the first thing that's going to happen is our client who's sitting there is going to uh, try to access an Office 365 service. The service is going to tell the client that it needs a service ticket signed by the authentication platform. So go back to your authentication platform and get a ticket from there. So the client's going to go out to the authentication platform now asking for that service ticket. Uh, the authentication platform is going to say, sorry, I can't let you sign in. You're going to need a login token signed by your on-premises uh, environment, in this case, ADFS. So we're going to head back inside our own environment and go talk to our ADFS server to request a login token. Once we get this token, we're going to come back and issue that back to the authentication platform. Now, this gets a little bit complicated, but now we're going to get a different token, an authentication token, which we can take back to our client and then issue to our website, and we're authenticated. Right? It is fairly straightforward. Uh, happy to go through it again if anyone's interested. There are other options, though. And that, that option we just talked through really only covers off your authentication through a website. Um, if you're going to um, go through uh, something like Link Online, then your authentication flow is going to change a little bit. So it might look like this in this case. So we're going to sign on to our Link Client. And it's immediately going to go and talk to the authentication platform. Uh, the authentication platform is going to say, look, you're, not, uh, you're using a domain registered as a federated domain, so you're going to have to go back on-premise and talk to your ADFS server. The ADFS server is going to come back. <coughs> and it's going to uh, get a user's logged on NTLM token or a Kerberos ticket and transform that into a SAML 1.1 token, which is then going to be returned. Excuse me. back to the client, which is going to return it to the authentication platform. And again, we get back the auth token, which is given to our client. And we're able to sign in to Link Online. I think there's a joke there about how many PowerPoint engineers does it take to do an identity <laughs> slide. This, is, this has been simplified, too. Uh, <laughs> All right, and this is the third and final uh, authentication flow, which is what's going to happen when you're signing on with Outlook or a device with ActiveSync. Um, now, has anyone ever actually logged on via Outlook and seen a redirection page? I don't think so, right? It's a very transparent, seamless uh, experience. And the same is true when you're signing on with a smartphone or a smart device. Right? You're never going to see a redirection page. It all just knows how to handle it behind the scenes. And this is the reason why. So the first thing that's going to happen is the client's actually logged onto their client desktop uh, within a corporate network, and they've started up Outlook. The client's actually going to send a request out to Exchange Online, and it's going to be challenged for basic credentials, which the client's going to respond with. OK, Exchange Online is then going to call what's called a Home Realm Discovery Service on the authentication platform. Basically, it's going to check and make sure that the domain the client's connecting with is a registered federated endpoint. And if that's the case, it's going to return the endpoint, and, uh, which is the address of the ADFS server. And Exchange Online is going to redirect out to the ADFS proxy server. ADFS uh, 2.0 is going to get the basic authentication credentials, authenticate the user against Active Directory, and get a Kerberos ticket. And again, the ADFS server will transform that Kerberos ticket into a SAML 1.1 token, claiming all, with all the necessary claims. And that SAML token will be returned to Exchange Online. So uh, Exchange Online then, <coughs> excuse me a second. 
So Exchange Online is going to pass that back up to authentication platform, and it's going to check that it's uh, signed by a trusted authority for the domain, and then transform it into an auth token. So again, we've got another auth token, which we pass back to Exchange Online. And the user's authenticated. All right. Now, one of the other benefits that uh, is perhaps not well mentioned about ADFS is uh, that we can have very strict client access control for our single sign-on. Right? Uh, in English, if we don't want people to sign on to Office 365, if we've outsourced our um, identity or our authentication back to a single sign-on point, such as ADFS, we can control exactly who authenticates to Office 365. Some examples of this, we might want to block all external access to Office 365. So Office 365 access is allowed from all clients inside the corporate network, but any requests from external clients are denied based on the IP address of the external client. So we can very quickly stop people from connecting to our Office 365 tenant through a single sign-on if they're outside the organization. Uh, another example might be Office 365. Uh, we're going to block all external access except for Exchange ActiveSync. So Office 365 access is going to be allowed from all clients on the internal network, as well as from external client devices such as smartphones, as long as they make use of ActiveSync. All other external clients, such as those using Outlook, will be blocked. And the third option I have is block all external access to Office 365, except for browser-based applications such as OA or SharePoint Online. Uh, so what we're going to do there is block external access, you know, anyone who's outside of our corporate network, uh, unless they're signing in through a passive browser-based application such as Outlook Web Access or SharePoint Online. And finally, we have a little bit to say on uh, multi-factor authentication. So for directory synchronization, you can actually make use of Azure's multi-factor authentication, uh, which is built into Azure Active Directory. If you're using single sign-on ADFS, uh, Azure multi-factor multi authentication server must be installed on your ADFS proxy servers to work. Now, the distinction there is that Azure multi-factor authentication is a component that's in Azure Active Directory. Azure multi-factor Azure multi authentication server uh, is a downloadable add-on that gets installed into ADFS. Uh, it's not the same thing. It doesn't actually exist inside Azure. Uh, there is also a TechNet article. Uh, sorry. I don't have that link up here, but there is a TechNet article that's easily findable. All you have to search for is Azure Active Directory, Office 365, and RSA. And that'll show you how you can extend, uh, if you didn't want to use Azure's multi-factor auth, you could actually use ADFS 2.0 and RSA to achieve two-factor authentication with single sign-on. And uh, the last, I think this is the last thing I wanted to mention, is the Office 365 adapter. Not to be confused with the Office 365 connector we mentioned a few minutes ago. This is actually not a product. This is a white paper. And the white paper is guidance on how to configure off-premises single sign-on. Now, that sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but one of the cool things you can do now is, using Azure virtual machines, we can actually load ADFS, um, the guidance in the white paper is to have a, a domain controller on, you know, off-site as well, a VPN back to your, your premises, and uh, all the necessary ADFS servers will then exist inside, uh, inside Azure as virtual machines, which you know, doesn't mean we need to add any capital investments into our data center. We don't need to deploy any servers. We don't need to maintain any servers. Uh, we've just reduced our data center footprint by allowing single sign-on with all of the virtual machines out in Azure. And that's it for me for the enhanced section. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So what this is really shown here is that we've got the ability to take you through from a, um, from a 365 perspective very simply into you know, pilot, uh, extend, and oh, sorry, pilot, deploy, and extend, and really giving you the ability to take that um, 365 experience and get that up and running quickly and easily. All of that heavy workload piece around your authentication options, your hybrid deployment, is where we sit in the enhanced space. And you can see why. It's a complex space. Authentication is key to this environment. And identity is one of the things that you want to make sure is actually working properly. And you don't want to stumble on not making the rest of the environment available to users just because the identity stuff is taking a bit longer to provision. So this is really where we're going to, I guess, finish up the session. Um, we've got time for questions and definitely time to, uh, you know, for you guys to, to hit us with all the hard-hitting questions. Um, but yeah, if you, want to, uh, if you want to take some time now, I'm happy for you to yep. throw out some stuff. Yeah, so. thank you all. Anyone who has a question, raise your hand, speak to it. Go ahead in front, because it's easy. Yeah, 
Yep. Put all the things needed to do. Yep. How do we get that? Talk to your uh, account team or cloud deployment partner, and they can get that to you. Does that work? It actually, it will exist in, so once it's provisioned, it'll exist within your Office 365 guy. environment. Yep. Um, but yeah, you can definitely have a talk to us. We can get that sorted for you, yep. no problem. Yeah, there was another question up top. I don't know if. Windows. So Office 365 uses org ID, which is separate from a live ID. And I, and I don't know if your question's specific to EDU space, like someone who's already on the uh, education platform. But our, our org ID does not conflict with the live ID. So when you become a, an org on Office 365 and they have a .yourcompany.com and that's their live ID, there's not a conflict on that. Correct. So we have outlook.office365.com, and that is the way you log in to Office 365, and that wouldn't conflict with outlook.com. Does that make sense? Yeah, we use org ID, not live ID, even though they're coming from the same kind of service. In the front here? Yeah. It is a pain. So I'm trying to think of how the, so if you try to go to outlook.com. Yeah, that was a BPOS issue, wasn't it? Was it Office 365? All right. I'll, uh, if you ha are you still having issues? Or it was an issue? OK, all right. Yeah, we use it easy now, so <laughs> thank you. I don't have any information on that plan, uh, but I hear you. And, and I, maybe we can talk to the identity team later in the week, but I don't know of any information on how you could make your Office 365 ID your Microsoft linked account. So from a corp perspective, how you would handle that. So the, the people yeah. I'd say to talk to, if you head out to the showcase, we have a, a bunch of guys who deal with our, um, they're our device technical solution professionals. They, they deal with Windows 8 and the identity area around Windows 8 and store and how that's dealt with. I think they were actually in here before this doing an 8.1 session. Um, go and have a talk to them. Look for a, a woman by the name of Leah Artini on that showcase. Um, she'll be able to help you and give you some information there and, and point you in the right direction. There is something we mentioned, which is uh, as your active director, you can use identities in there to sign in against different services. That's, I don't know if that's coming yeah, sooner. if not it's the store yet. Correct, yeah. but not the store. Yeah, ADFS can be used across various services that allow ADFS, but not the, not the store. Not the store, yeah. So. Um, in the front here. It is available on TechNet. It was, it's in the latest version of DirSync. So the question was, is the password sync available in DirSync now? Uh, in FIM. You still need PCNS, I think. Yeah, you would have to do it. You would have to do it with PCNS or another way. It is not the the DirSync password sync way. No, the, the DirSync's a very very customized version of the FIM, uh, cut down a customized version of FIM. So it, you can't just load those components into FIM, as far as I know. Harris.
Correct. So the question is, and I'm going to summarize, and, and, and you'll nod or shake your head at me in a moment, is the idea around vanity URLs for SharePoint authenticated websites within Office 365. Correct? Um, so you, you're correct. At the moment, you cannot put vanity URLs for SharePoint for anything that sits behind the authentication um, barrier of SharePoint Online. The only place you can have a vanity URL exists with the public website. Um, I'm not sure what the roadmap is on that at the moment, um, if that's something we're looking at. But um, at the moment, yeah, that, that first name you choose. And when I work with customers, that first name I get them to choose, I get them to have a think about in a, in a big way. Because if they, and I, I always warn against people signing up a, you know, Contoso trial or Contoso 365 trial dot on Microsoft.com namespace because in those instances that Contoso 365 trial will become their SharePoint environment as well. It'll be Contoso 365 trial dot SharePoint dot com. So you end up needing to have them think about that and that's where you can have a bit of a, a think if you're a partner with the customers and if you're a customer have a think about what you want that namespace to be. Some customers I have are very happy to have a namespace that says that actually implies it's an online service. So if it's contoso365.sharepoint.com, people know that they are now putting their, their data in a cloud-based service. Um, if, it's a, you know, if, it's, if it's something else, if they really want the brand of just contoso.onmicrosoft.com or contoso.sharepoint.com, then they can do that as well. But have that kind of you know, first namespace and a couple of backups in play as well, because it is a worldwide domain kind of registration process that we're using. And there are, I have had instances where customers have had the name they want taken by an organization with a similar name in the US or somewhere else. So, but you're right, at the moment Short you can't answer, do it. you're correct, and it's very important to make sure you choose the right tenant name. Yeah, so I, I totally agree. The issue of someone taking the name you want, <coughs> I think the other scenario that comes up is a company that decides after they deploy 365 that they want to rebrand, and then they have no way to do that in their existing tenant name. Correct. We hear you. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> thank you for the feedback. Yeah. So the question is, is there, is there plans to say, cool, just use Azure Active Directory and nothing else? Truth is, you could do that now if you wanted to. And, and you know, in the SME space, I know there are a lot of people that do, right? And that, that kind of small to medium business, there are places that do that. They don't want the infrastructure locally. Um, so they will, they will, and it's usually, honestly, it fits really well to just use the cloud identities that are provided when it's kind of a, a startup or an organization with very few users. Um, when you're looking at, at organizations that do have an investment in Active Directory on premise today, then you can start to look at, you know, hosted infrastructure or all those kind of things, you know, AD hosted out of Azure as an infrastructure as a service or something along those lines to so actually host the DC in Azure. Um, so there are the options to do that as well. Um, and I know I've got customers who actually do that as their failover for ADFS as well. So the high availability for ADFS actually fails over to an Azure service for ADFS rather than having a whole bunch of extra HA in, um, infrastructure on-prem. Did that not answer your question? Yeah, all right. I think it's intentionally not answering your question. Uh, so we don't, have any, we don't have any information on plans or changes within Azure AD. So, but we have a ton of options that you can utilize now to start looking down that road. If, if you are looking at uh, reducing uh, central infrastructure for your devices, like laptops and the like, you could look at Intune yeah. as an option. And you know, that way you have mailboxes, your SharePoint link, all that in Office 365. Uh, you can have all your devices connected up to Intune, and you, I think you're using the same identity. It's all as your ID. Just got another one up the back here. Didn't quite hear that. Sorry, we're going to get you to yell really loud. <laughs> Outlook client with ADFS. So the truth is the Outlook client 
the Outlook client will pass through the credentials, but you do have to remember the password as well. If I'm on the corporate domain, it'll go through. Um, if I'm on a corporate device in the domain, my creds will go through. Um, if I'm outside the domain and I reset my password, I'll get prompted for that the first time and I'll hit remember and I don't need to touch it again. Um, it just depends on where that happens. So there is a level of integration in that point. It is going to find where that ADFS server is and go through that. All right. Cool. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank really you appreciate it. Oh, right. One more. One more. Sorry. One more. Problem. <laughs> yeah. So the UPN will need to match the public-facing domain. We won't let you sync a Ben Walters at blah.local. It needs to be a public-facing domain to be that primary UPN, so it would be something you'd need to look at. Um, the, so essentially, to do that, you'll need to have that UPN change. Now, I can, you'll still have your users logging onto their machine with you know, their domain credentials. That's fine. It's just when they start to log into the service, they'll be using an email address. Correct. Correct. Yep. Correct. The reason being, too, is that when we get through, and especially when we look at going through this process, you synchronize the user up with an email address initially. When we do, um, so when we create the users in the pilot stage um, with that email address, when we get to doing Dersync, Dersync will actually do a match based on that as well to try and make sure that both users on the on-prem are matching the ones in the cloud, so you're not going to get duplication. Um, so there is some, some reasons why that's there, but that is a requirement. When they start, anything they hit in the cloud, they'll need to use their email address to log on with. All right, thank you all very much. Cool. Have thank a great you. show.